Section 29 of the Algonquin Legends of New England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary in Arkansas. The Algonquin Legends of New England or Myths and Folklore of the Micmac, Passamaquoddy, and Pitapscot Tribes by Charles Godfrey Leland. Section 29. The story of the great Chinoo, as told by the Passamaquoddies. Passamaquoddy. What the Micmacs call a Chinoo is known to the Passamaquoddies as a Yafakwa, or Yavokwa, and this is their origin. When the Katich Miti Ulan, or Great Big Witch, footnote. When legends from the Anglo-Indian manuscript collection of Mitchell are given, many of the phrases or words in the original are retained, without regard to style or correctness. Wizard should be placed here for witch. End footnote. Is conquered by the smaller witches, or Metusilisk. They can kill him or turn him into a Kewakwa. He still fights, however, with the other Kewakwa. When they are ready to fight, they suddenly become as tall as the highest trees. Their weapons are the trees themselves, which they uproot with great strength. And this strength depends upon the quantity or size of the piece of ice which makes the heart of the Kewakwa. This piece of ice is like a little human figure, with hands, feet, head, and every member perfect. The female Kewakwa is more powerful than the male. They make a noise like a roaring lion but sharper, shriller, and more frightful. Their abode is somewhere in Las Modas Dulcic, in some cold region in far northern Canada. In summer they rub themselves all over with puka wigu, or fur balsam, and then roll themselves on the ground so that everything adheres to the body, moss, leaves, and even small sticks. This was often seen of old by Indian hunters. Once a newly married Indian couple had, according to Indian custom, gone on the long fall and winter hunt. One day when the man was away, an old Kewakwa came and looked into the wigwam. The wife was frightened, but she made up her mind at once. She called him Matunskal, or my father. The old Kewakwa was very proud to be called father. When she heard her husband returning, she ran out and told him that a great Kewakwa was in the camp and that he must call him Misolhos, or father-in-law. So going in he did this, and the Kawakwa was still more pleased. So they lived with him and hunted with him. He was very skillful in the chase. When they came to broad and deep waters, the Kawakwa would swim them with his son-in-law on his back. He could run faster than any wild animal. One day he told his children to go away to a great distance. There is a great female Kawakwa coming to fight me. In the struggle I may not know you and may hurt you. So they went away as fast and as far as they could. But they heard the fighting, the most frightful noises, howls, yells, thundering and crashing of wood and rocks. After a time the man determined to see the fight. When he got to the place he saw a horrible sight. Big trees uprooted the giants in a deadly struggle. Then the Indian, who was very brave and was afraid that his father-in-law would be killed, came up and helped as much as he could, and in fact so much that between them they killed the enemy. The old Kawakwa was badly but not fatally hurt, and the woman was very glad her father came off victorious. She had always heard that a Kawakwa had a piece of ice for a heart. If this can be taken out, the Kawakwa can be tamed and cured. So she made a preparation, or medicine, and offered it to him. He, d he did not know what it was, nor its strength, so he swallowed it, and it gave him a vomit. She saw something drop, so quietly picked it up. It was the figure of a man of ice. It was the Kawakwa's heart. She, not being seen or noticed, put it in the fire, when he cried, "'Daughter, you are killing me now! You destroy my strength!' Yet she made him take more of the medicine and a second heart came out. This she also put on the fire. But when a third came, he grabbed it from her hand and swallowed it. However, he was almost entirely cured. Another time an Indian village was visited by a Kawakwa, but he was driven away by magic. The people marked crosses on the trees where they expected the Kawakwa to come. 
there was great excitement among the indians expecting to hear their strange visitor with his frightful noises it was the old people who gave the advice to mark crosses on the trees another time an indian of either the passamaquoddy or marishite tribe was turned to a kewakwa the last time he was seen was by a party of indian hunters who recognized him he had only small strips of clothing this country he said is too warm for me i am going to a colder one this story from the passamaquoddy anglo-indian manuscript of mitchell supplies some very important deficiencies in the preceding micmac version we are told that the heart of the chinu is of ice in human figure this human figure is that of the kawakwa himself or rather his very self or microcosm it is this and not the liver which is swallowed by the victor who thus adds another frozen quote, soul end quote, to his own of the three vomited by the kawakwa two were the hearts of enemies whom he had conquered he could not give up his own however it is much more according to common sense that the woman should have given the cannibal the magic medicine which made him yield his heart than that he should voluntarily have purged himself in the micmac tale he merely relieves his stomach in the passamaquoddy version he by woman's influence loses his icy heart it is interesting to observe that the use of the christian cross is in the additional anecdote described as magic it is the main point in the chinu stories that this horrible being this most devilish of devils is at first human perhaps an unusually good girl or youth from having the heart once chilled she or he goes on in cruelty until at last the sufferer eats the heart of another she knew especially of females then utter wickedness ensues it is more than probable that this leads us back to some dark and terrible shaman's superstition older than we can now fathom there is a passage in the edda which its translator thorpe thinks can never be explained i believe he writes the difficulty is beyond help the lines are as follows following footnote from the edda page one twelve loki scorched up in his heart's affections had found a half-burnt woman's heart loki became guileful from that wicked woman thence in the world End footnote. of which thorpe writes the sense of this and the following line is not apparent they stand thus in the original loki of hiarta lardy brindu fan lian hafisten hugstein konu for which grim myth for read all three seven would read loki at hiarta lundi brenda etc lokius comedit cor in nemor asum invenit simistum mentis lapidum mulieris whatever obscurity exists here it is evident that it means that loki having become bad grew worse after having got the half-burnt stone of a woman's soul that is his own heart half ruined became utterly so after he had added to it the demoralized hugstein soul stone thought stone or heart of a woman if we assume that stone and heart are the same the difficulty vanishes and they are one in the chinu who like loki illustrates or symbolizes the passage from good to evil which a german writer declares is quicker than thought that the very same hujai which the norse myth puts forward as swiftest of all runners loki not as yet lost gets the stone heart of a giantess and becomes an utter devil at once the chinu becomes an utter devil when he has swallowed the thought stone of a giantess and so does loki the girl chinu micmac of the old time far up the saguenay river a branch turns off to the north running back into the land of ice and snow ten families went up this stream one autumn in their canoes to be gone all winter on a hunt among them was a beautiful girl twenty years of age a young man in the band wished her to become his wife but she flatly refused him perhaps she did it in such a way as to wound his pride certainly she roused all that was savage in him and he gave up all his mind to revenge he was skilled in medicine or in magic so he went into the woods and gathered an herb which makes people insensible 
Then stealing into the lodge when all were asleep, he held it to the girl's face until she had inhaled the odor and could not be easily awakened. Going out he made a ball of snow, and returning placed it in the hollow of her neck, in front, just below the throat. Then he retired without being discovered, so she could not awake while the chill went to her heart. Footnote. The Eskimo shamans and the Indian Buoan are familiar with many very ingenious and singular ways of producing prolonged illness and death. There is one known to a very few old gypsies of gradually inducing insanity and death, which I have never seen noted in any work on toxicology. In a work which I lately read, it was positively denied that there was any such thing as a, quote, lingering poison, end quote, footnote end. When she awoke, she was chilly, shivering, and sick. She refused to eat. This lasted long, and her parents became alarmed. They inquired what ailed her. She was ill-tempered. She said nothing was the matter. One day, having been sent to the spring for water, she remained absent so long that her mother went to seek her. Approaching unseen, she observed her greedily eating snow. And asking her what it meant, the daughter explained that she felt within a burning sensation, which the snow relieved. More than that, she craved the snow. The taste of it was pleasant to her. After a few days, she began to grow fierce, as though she wished to kill someone. At last she begged her parents to kill her. Hitherto she had loved them very much. Now she told them that unless they killed her, she would certainly be their death. Her whole nature was being changed. How can we kill you? her mother asked. You must shoot me, she replied, with seven arrows. Footnote. The Micmac version gives guns, but the Chinu stories are evidently very ancient and refer to terrors of the olden time. End footnote. And if you can kill me with seven shots, all will be well. But if you cannot, I shall kill you. Seven men shot at her as she sat in the wigwam. She was not bound. Every arrow struck her in the breast, but she sat firm and unmoved. Forty-nine times they pierced her. From time to time she looked up with an encouraging smile. When the last arrow struck, she fell dead. Then they burned the body as she had directed. It was soon reduced to ashes with the exception of the heart, which was of the hardest ice. This required much time to melt and break. At last all was over. She had been brought under the power of an evil spirit. She was rapidly being changed into a she knew, a wild, fierce, unconquerable being. But she knew it all the while, and it was against her will, so she begged that she might be killed. The Indians left the place. Since that day, none have ever returned to it. They feared lest some small part of the body might have remained unconsumed, and that from it another Chinu would rise, capable of killing all whom she met. Footnote. Mr. Rand, manuscript, gives a detailed account of an Indian who went mad during the winter, ran away naked into the wilderness among the snow, and was unanimously declared to have turned into a she knew. I agree with Mr. Rand that the historical basis of these tales, if they have any, may be the same, a case of lunacy, fiction and figure, adding to the incredible details. End footnote. End of section 29. Recording by Mary in Arkansas.